Well, this is a little bonus. Some lessons in godly living. Lesson number one, the habit of godliness. In 1989, a Mormon named Stephen Covey uh, wrote a number one national best-selling book called The Seven Habits of a Highly Effective uh, of highly effective people. These seven habits were be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win, seek first to understand, then be understood, synergize and sharpen your old saw. Wow, you made millions of dollars with that little list, and I just gave it to you for free. Isn't that good? Um, So over the past seven years, this book has seen phenomenal sales. It's still, look at the New York Times list, it's still a big seller. Amazing. The title is what attracted me. Tonight, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we should each be learning the seven habits of highly effective Christians. I mean, who cares about some Mormon philosophy of highly effective people? Uh, anything that's good, he probably got from the Bible. The rest of it is self-motivation. So, I mean, it's an interesting book, but it's really pull yourself up by your bootstrings kind of stuff. But look at this. In the life of a 7th century B.C. teenager named Daniel who was captured in war, sent off his booty to the winning side. Let's learn some of these habits from God's word. In the book of Daniel, let's explore, discover, and cultivate these habits. Daniel's life contained the seven ingredients that blended into his powerful, godly life. What are they? Well, real quickly, I'll just read off and even give you the the fill-in-the-blank ones, okay, before we go. Number one, make up your mind about obeying God. And you know, it's... I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, heiress tense, once and for all, make up the decision that you are going to obey God. Now, it doesn't mean we never fail him, but there is an unswerving resolve. I remember not too long after May 1st, 1983, I made a decision that there was one woman for one man for life in my life. Uh, That happened to be the first day I met Bonnie. I mean, (laughs) the first day I met her, I just went, that's who I prayed for all my life. There she is. She didn't know that until the second day. But uh, I did. And I remember making up my mind about her. And if I can make up my mind about a human, why can't we make up our mind about God? And just say, as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, period. Just, just, if you haven't yet, make up your mind about obeying God. Number two, give God the credit always. That's 219. I told you I'd mention it again. Daniel praised the God of heaven. Just, just make it. It's a life habit. God doesn't share. God is jealous. That's one of his eternal attributes. He's jealous. We think jealousy is bad. Jealousy is good if you're God. And, and he says, I'm jealous, and I don't share my glory with anyone else. Give God the credit always. Did you know that every time we do something and someone comes up fawning all over us, making all over us, and we sit there and we kind of go, you're right. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Oh, that is odious to God. Awful. He doesn't like that at all. Give God the credit always. Number three, point to God when people look to you. Point to God. If you, I mean, if everybody's falling apart around you and you're standing firm and they look at you, point to God. You know what I mean? Just point to God. It, it's, it's an exciting thing. And I already had read this verse to you also. Verse 28 of chapter 2, there is a God in heaven. Point to God when people point at you, when people look to you, when people think that you're a pillar of strength in this situation. Point to God. He's the one that's holding you up. And, and that's, that's one of the seven habits that Daniel had. It's the secret of his life. Number four, have the unshakable conviction that God reigns. I mean, I have friends whose family members have gotten AIDS, through blood transfusions, through other things. But we thought only those wicked sodomites got that. No. I mean, have the unshakable conviction that God reigns. I mean, if a child dies and if someone gets a horrible disease or if their life is cut short or if they are born with, a, with an unchangeable feature or a deformity or a disability or whatever, have the, the unshakable conviction that God reigns. It's kind of an exciting habit to have. I mean, you just, you just are kind of excited about what God's going to do. Refuse to fear mere mortals. You know, when you think about it, how can we be afraid of people we can see because they can't determine our destiny and not be afraid of the God who's going to determine our eternal destiny? You know, for the fear of man 
we, we so often neglect to do the work of God. And, and it was a habit of Daniel's life. He refused to fear mere mortals. He said, stoke up the furnace all you want. My friends won't bow. Throw me in the lion's den. I won't stop praying. I'm not going to fear mere mortals. Remember, they're going to die too. They're going to die just like we are unless the Lord comes. Number five, we should remember they're just mortals. Number six, remind yourself who owns your breath. Uh, I like this. I have to read 523. And you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. You have brought the vessels of his house before him and your lords and your wives and your concubines. You have drunk wine from them. From these vessels, they carried blood around to the altar. The prostitutes and the drunken people were drinking their alcohol out of it. And he says, God doesn't like that. You have praised the gods of... They were toasting. They were taking these, these vessels from the temple and toasting all their gods, you know, and doing all this stuff. God doesn't like that. They don't see, they don't hear or know. But listen to this. The God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. You know, we need to have the secret that Daniel had as a habit of life. Remember who owns your life's breath. You're not going to breathe a day longer or a moment less because he's holding it in his hand. And remember, no one can take our life away from us until God's appointed moment. God says, I've made an appointment with you. It's appointed unto us once to die. And that's, that's a real comfort. Finally, not only should we be those who make up our mind about obeying God and give God the credit and point to God when people look to us and have the unshakable conviction God reigns and refuse to fear mere mortals and remind ourselves who owns their breath. Number seven, we need to get and keep godly contentment. I hope that the next time someone has some gold and they're going to throw it around your neck or my neck, that we'll quote Daniel 5.17. Then Daniel answered the king, you can keep your gifts for yourself. You can give all those rewards to someone else. I'll still do what God wants me to do but I don't need all that stuff. Wow, what a liberating habit. Let me conclude with spiritual depth for busy people. Five elements or keys to growing a, a spiritual life that operates even when you're busy. You have to have prayers that are biblical, that are honest, that are automatic, that are committed. Remember you had the doors open? He's going to get in trouble. He didn't care. And they're regular, uh, as always. Three times a day, like he always did. I mean, if you're busy, your life is less likely to unravel if it's hemmed in prayer. That's something we need to realize.